This episode of Because Science is sponsored by Borderlands 3. Kyle, you're a secret supervillain. We all know it. Yeah, it's me. I need an orbital strike. Enact Project Thor. <laughs> Get it done. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, sir. Project Thor is one of the most infamous, almost developed space weapons of all time. You may have heard the name and you may have even seen the concept in movies, but what is Project Thor? How would it work and what kind of destruction could it cause? Let's get technical. A few years after the start of the Cold War, both the United States and the Soviet Union were ramping into mutually assured destruction, developing, among other world enders, ICBMs, or intercontinental ballistic missiles. These were extremely long-range weapons that could take nuclear warheads thousands of kilometers away. In 1955, the United States had a different idea. To keep up with Soviet production, they wanted rapidly constructed rockets that could hit closer targets. The first of these intermediate range ballistic missiles was codenamed Thor. By the end of the Cold War, thankfully, none of these IRB Mjolnirs ever had to be used. That is until a man named Dr. Jerry Pornell took this Thor idea to space. Working at Boeing at the time and piggybacking off of the Thor missile technology, in 1964, Dr. Jerry Pornell first described an orbital weapon system that could be a way towards unlimited space power. He published his idea in 1975 and referred to it as Project Thor. The idea of Project Thor was relatively simple. Instead of maintaining complicated weapon systems on the ground, you could instead just put a bunch of big metal poles in orbit. <laughs> Like ICBMs, these orbital telephone poles, as Dr. Pornell described them, could be set up to strike targets on Earth. However, because these poles are in orbit and they have a crazy orbital velocity, multiple rods set up in orbit around the Earth could guarantee that an ominous cylinder of doom could be over any target on the planet in as little as 15 minutes. Once one of these tubes of doom was over a target on Earth, a signal from the ground would be given to start the deorbiting process. Already in low Earth orbit, a pole or a satellite system containing multiple poles would either break or expend some fuel to change trajectories. Just minutes after this deorbiting process, a sinister cylinder from outer space would strike a target on the ground with incredible velocity. Dr. Pornell didn't know who first came up with the phrase, but the theoretical ability for Project Thor to summon giant destructive hunks of metal anywhere on Earth at will like Mjolnir here is probably why this idea came to be known as Rods from God. After his time at Boeing, Dr. Pornell went on to become a successful science fiction writer and popularized this idea in his books. Today though, I think this concept has penetrated pop culture enough in video games and books and movies and TV shows and that there's actually some confusion about the original concept. So being good super vi space weapons enthusiasts, it's time to set the record straight. Still worthy. So let's outline exactly what these metal thunderbolts could realistically do. Why? Because knowing is half the battle. Because science! One of the appeals of a weapon system like this is that it uses very simple projectiles. This bad boy is solid metal. No warheads or explosives inside, just some fins for stabilization and an internal guidance system which can read GPS and signals from the ground. This is a dirt cheap design, at least compared to modern missiles which can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars a piece. And these are mass producible. The most cited dimensions for one of these projectiles comes from a 2003 report by the U.S. Air Force. According to that report, an effective orbital lawn dart might have a one foot diameter and be around 20 feet long. You can see why these were referred to as orbital telephone poles. With the given dimensions, we're talking about 115 gallons of pointy space metal moving at orbital velocity. And because of that velocity, Dr. Pornell suggested making these telephone poles out of tungsten. 
Tungsten or Wolfram is an incredibly robust element and it has two properties that are important for orbital bombardment purposes. The first is that tungsten has the highest known melting point of any element and the second is that this is very, very dense, around twice as dense as lead. If this orbital telephone pole was made out of something less robust, it might burn up in the atmosphere or not have enough mass to do some real damage and we don't want just a shooting star that does nothing. We want a tungsten thunderbolt, yeah! Sorry. But why orbital lawn darts? Couldn't Project Thor use something even simpler, like a tungsten sphere, like giant destructive gumballs from God? The reason is drag. Any weapon system that has to travel from space down to the surface of our planet necessarily has to travel through the atmosphere. Because these orbital telephone poles don't have any warheads or explosives, we would want to minimize drag and the force of air on them to maintain speed as much as possible. In the force of drag equation, we cannot change the density of the air, but we can change the cross-sectional area that that air might push on. This cylinder and this sphere have roughly the same diameter and therefore the same cross-sectional area available to the force of drag. But look at just how much more mass you can fit behind this cross-sectional area if you're using a cylinder as your shape. More mass, less drag, more dangerous. The destructive power of Project Thor has everything to do with mass and velocity. Out here? Project Thor has a number of theoretical advantages. The first is raw, ferocious speed. Every destructive weapon has to get its destructive energy from somewhere. A conventional bomb gets it from the chemical energy stored within the bonds of its material, and Thor's tungsten telephone poles would get its energy from kinetic energy. Now show them the equation. <laughs> All right, how do I even get reception out here? The energy of motion that will go into any Project Thor impact will be a result of the projectile's large mass, in this case 8,300 kilograms, almost 20,000 pounds, based on the density of tungsten, and the projectile's velocity. Obviously, velocity will be the large driver here because it is squared in our kinetic energy equation. Now, I think when we imagine objects orbiting the Earth, like these orbital telephone poles, they always seem to be moving slowly in our heads, and that's true, they do, but only when you're looking at it at this scale. If you zoom in a bit, you realize that orbital velocity is blisteringly quick. For example, moving at 7.8 kilometers per second, a rod from God could complete the 100 meter dash before a nerve impulse from your brain could tell your mouth to say, wow. This velocity is why Project Thor can be simple and doesn't need warheads. Uh, it's been reported over the years across the internet, in articles, and in videos that a rod from God has another potential advantage besides simplicity. Upon impact, it might have the energy of a nuclear bomb. However, we mentioned drag before, and that's because any Project Thor projectile will have to pass through the atmosphere before hitting the ground, and this means that it will necessarily slow way down. That US Air Force report estimated a reduction in velocity from around eight kilometers per second to around three, or Mach 10. Do the math with our previously stated numbers and you find that a single Project Thor projectile might impart 50 billion joules worth of kinetic energy to a target. This is obviously a lot, but it's still a thousand times less energy than even our first nuclear weapon. So Project Thor isn't on the same level. That doesn't mean that a rod from God wouldn't be terrifyingly destructive. Here is some footage of a test of an explosive called the mother of all bombs, an explosion with roughly equivalent energy. The thought of an orbiting hunk of metal dropping out of nowhere, anywhere in the world within minutes and making that happen is definitely sobering and scary. And it's probably why we still talk about Project Thor today. But why do we just talk about Project Thor? Why in 70 years hasn't a military implemented a system like this? <laughs> 
Dr. Pornell considered Project Thor to be a sort of magic bullet against hard targets that needed to be taken out quickly. For example, he estimated that a single projectile could rip any ship currently afloat in half. It could destroy any bridge and demolish basically any building. Because of the projectile size and their extreme velocity, these are very, very hard to detect, deflect, or destroy. It all sounds like the perfect weapon system, but Dr. Pornell himself said that Project Thor, even in limited use, makes no sense. Project Thor is obviously an interesting concept or else we wouldn't still be talking about it today, but it's wildly impractical because of cost. The cost of getting just a single rod that is eight metric tons into space, let alone a whole system of rods and satellites is prohibitively expensive. According to Dr. Pornell, this system was ready to be designed and implemented in the 80s, but because the cost of getting a single kilogram into space didn't go way down like commercial airlines line flight costs, this metal thunderbolt concept just never got off the ground, I think. And so Project Thor never got off the ground in reality, but it did certainly take off in science fiction. After Dr. Pornell became a sci-fi author, he refined his ideas with legendary author Larry Niven, and their ideas spread to nearly all forms of sci-fi media, from movies like G.I. Joe, to video games like Call of Duty, to shows like Babylon 5. We can't be totally sure that a concept similar to Project Thor isn't currently being developed. I mean, that report from the U.S. Air Force was in 2003, and there was a very similar patent filed by China in 2016. But for now, this classic science fiction concept has to remain just that, fiction. Because of, oh, sorry. Yeah, because science. No, you don't get to say it. I get to say it. Yeah, just, just order the strike. <laughs> <laughs> Uh. We kind of quickly glossed over the point that a cylinder uh, shape for a projectile can have a lot more mass than a sphere with the same diameter. And I want to return to that just for a second because it affects all modern weaponry. It's not just Project Thor. So we used to have like musket balls that we'd shoot and now we have more elongated bullets. And one of the reasons why we've done this is because again, you can fit a lot more mass in this more cylindrical shape than you could in a sphere of the same diameter. So. All the bullets are like tiny little Thors. Thanks again to Borderlands 3 for sponsoring today's episode. The original shooter looter is back and bigger than ever. With four all new vault hunters and over one billion guns, it's time to lock, load, and loot. Pick up your copy on Xbox One, PS4, or PC now. Let's make some mayhem. Rated M for Mature. Oh, you're, you're still here. I'll, let me, why don't, Thank you so much for watching, Steve, and if you like this video, you will probably like some of our other space science-y videos where we do a lot of weird stuff to our planets and stuff. And if you want to follow me and Because Science on social media to suggest ideas for future episodes or just to, you know, do that sick liking and retweeting, you can do that here. Thanks. <laughs>